Good morning, everyone. I'd like to uh, thank everybody for the great presentation so far. And it is with great pleasure that I introduce our third year fellow, graduating fellow, Dr. Jamin Shah, who has been unbelievably prolific in his research. This only represents a fraction of all of the studies that Dr. Shah has performed, but this one is really like off the charts good. Uh, fluorescent lifetime imaging microscopy detects differences in metabolic signatures between euploid and aneuploid human blastocysts. And Dr. Shah is going to explain exactly what that means. And for those of you who want to read more about this, his thesis has been published in the journal Human Reproduction this past March. And uh, Dr. Shah, take it away. Uh, Alan, thank you for that warm introduction. I have no disclosures. So in IVF, once we retrieve a patient's oocytes, we fertilize the oocytes with sperm to create embryos. These figures show the progression from an oocyte to a day one embryo, to a day three embryo, and finally to a day five to seven blastocyst. Here's a time-lapse video of an embryo developing from the two pronuclei stage all the way to a blastocyst. This is the 2PN stage. Now this is the two cell stage. This is the four cell stage. It's now progressing to the day three embryo or six to eight cells. And now it's progressing to the day four or the morula stage, about 16 to 32 cells. Now it's slowly developing into the blastocyst stage or a day five embryo. Once an embryo reaches day five or the blastocyst stage, uh, the embryologist will grade an embryo using the Gardner morphology criteria, looking at the embryo stage and evaluating the inner cell mass and trophectoderm. The top four images shown on this slide represent an early blastocyst or stage three, uh, all the way to a hatched blastocyst or stage six. Then the embryologist grades the inner cell mass and the trophectoderm as shown in the bottom figure. The inner cell mass develops into the fetus and the trophectoderm develops into the placenta. Looking at these two images, which embryo would you transfer? And which embryo is euploid? Without determining the ploidy status of the embryo, we base the decision of which embryo to transfer by the day of development and morphologic designation by the embryologist. This is something all REI clinicians think about. In what order should we transfer an embryo in order to give our patients the highest chance of a live birth? Embryo assessment can be performed in different ways. Morphology is the traditional way of embryo assessment, which is non-invasive but subjective. Alternatively, pre-implantation genetic testing for aneuploidy, or PGTA as known, requires an invasive trophectoderm biopsy but is objective. There is developing technology that uses a non-invasive PGTA approach to evaluate embryo culture media, which is still under development and it remains to be seen how this will impact clinical care. Many studies have published on the utility of artificial intelligence as a non-invasive and objective measure to assist in embryo viability and predictions, but currently its use is still limited in clinical care. Despite these technologies, there's still room for improvement in optimizing embryo selection to improve implantation and pregnancy rates. Our group has been utilizing a novel, non-invasive and objective metabolic imaging modality called fluorescence lifetime imaging microscopy or FLIM, which has shown significant results in the mouse model and in human discarded embryos. Glucose metabolism is related to embryo viability. Specifically, mitochondrial function is essential to the viability of embryos due to the necessary ATP produced via glycolysis, the Krebs cycle, and the electron transport chain. 
NADH is essential in both the cytoplasm and in the mitochondrial complex one, with FAD essential in the mitochondrial complex two. In a study by Gardner et al. in 2011, he demonstrated that glucose consumption of single post-compaction human embryos is predictive of a live birth and embryo sex. Embryo sex differences hints that there may be a relationship between chromosomes and metabolism. NADH and FAD are essential intermediates in cellular respiration and ATP production. NADH in its reduced form and FAD in its oxidized form are both autofluorescent and no dyes or markers are needed to facilitate the metabolic imaging. Fluorescence lifetime imaging microscopy of NADH and FAD are non-invasive. Fluorescence lifetime imaging microscopy uses a two-photon excitation system to measure the average time a molecule stays in its excited state before emitting a photon. The detector will record and measure the arrival time of all fluorescent photons reflecting the microenvironment of the embryo's metabolic behavior. A fluorophore is a fluorescent chemical compound that can re-emit light upon light excitation. So here's a depiction of what I just described of how FLIM works. So NADH is in the top row and FAD is in the second row. The first set of images show the FLIM intensity and autofluorescence reflecting the mitochondrial spatial distribution in a blastocyst as NADH and FAD are highly concentrated in the mitochondria. The second and third set of images show the imaging processing and machine learning allowing for automated recognition of mitochondrial and cytoplasmic regions. Then all the photon arrival times can be combined into one arrival histogram which are fitted to an exponential decay model, producing quantitative information of eight metabolic parameters, four for NADH and four for FAD, including brightness or fluorescence intensity, fraction bound, and long and short lifetimes. Brightness or concentration is the number of excited fluorophores divided by the area of an embryo and the number of integrated scans. Fraction bound or fraction engaged is the extent to which the molecules are engaged with enzymes. Short lifetime is the average time FAD is bound to the enzyme or the average time NADH is not bound. And long lifetime is the average time NADH is bound to an enzyme and the average time FAD is not, so just vice versa. Another useful value we can obtain from these parameters is redox ratio, which is NADH intensity divided by FAD intensity, which represents cellular metabolism or how well the electron transport chain is functioning. In a safety study using the FLIM in the mouse model led by Tim Sanchez, he had 144 experimental embryos in which uh, they were imaged every two hours for 60 seconds over a course of 48 hours for a total of 24 measurements performed at 30 milliwatt and 50 milliwatt, and these were transferred to pups. And then there's also 156 control embryos that were transferred that were not illuminated. And there was no significant differences in the live birth rate or the birth weight. The damage threshold for illumination power was identified from the study on the previous slide. For low illumination powers, there was no apparent effect on the blastocyst development rates in the mouse model. And in my study I'll discuss shortly, we used one third of that power, which was done in this safety study. In this study, led by my colleague, Dr. Emily Seidler, she worked on the FLIM with the mouse model and assessed the metabolic function of mouse embryos that were exposed to transient hypoxia. In her study, she flushed 0% oxygen into the FLIM chamber for 90 minutes, which is shown in the top part of the figure with a decline in oxygen, and then 5% oxygen gas was restored for 30 minutes. In these pictures of an embryo, you can see metabolic changes are occurring. The metabolic changes were in the NADH intensity and fraction engaged parameters. In a control group, when the oxygen was maintained at 5%, you can see the metabolic state of the embryos stayed relatively consistent. 
In this study led by Tim Sanchez, he used the phlegm and imaged mouse embryos at various stages of embryo development from the first division to the blastocyst stage. In these figures, he was able to clearly show metabolic differences between the first division versus the morula stage or day four, morula versus blastocyst, and first division versus blastocyst. In this study led by Marta Venturas, one of my collaborators from Harvard, she investigated if non-invasive metabolic imaging via phlegm can detect variations in metabolic profiles between discarded human blastocysts. In this analysis of over 215 embryos, which included all of my embryos from my analysis, it demonstrated metabolic differences when comparing the inner cell mass versus the trophectoderm as seen in this image. However, when analyzing all embryos by their designated morphology as seen in this next figure, none of the phlegm parameters show significant metabolic differences. In this next figure, we show that at different stages of blastocyst development, such as stage three, four, five, or six, there were significant uh, metabolic differences present between early stage blastocysts to hatch blastocysts. In this figure, we compared day five versus day six embryos and showed significant metabolic differences when comparing these groups. Furthermore, in this second figure, you can see metabolic differences by embryo day and embryo stage. In this next figure, we imaged blastocysts over a span of 36 hours and we showed the phlegm parameters had continual metabolic variations over time during blastocyst development and also showed the spatial pattern of metabolic signatures between the inner cell mass and the trophectoderm, with some parameters increasing and some decreasing as embryos progressed past the early blastocyst stage. The color bars on the right show the average photon arrival time for NADH and FAD in nanoseconds. This film video is representing the blastocyst development from the prior slide showing the differences in metabolic signatures at the different stages of development and between inner cell mass and trophectoderm. In my present study, I investigated if non-invasive metabolic imaging via fluorescence lifetime imaging microscopy can detect differences between euploid and aneuploid discarded human blastocyst. This was a prospective observational study in which I performed at Boston IVF from August 2019 to February of 2020. We had 156 discarded vitrified day five to seven blastocyst of which 17 were euploid and 139 were aneuploid by PGTA, and we utilized Gardner morphology. For our statistical analysis, we use a multi-level modeling, controlling for day of blastocyst development, stage of blastocyst expansion, morphology, and maternal age. And we had it performed a post hoc correction using the Hochberg's false discovery rate with the p-value of less than 0.05 considered significant, and we had IRB approval. I thawed blastocysts and incubated them for two hours prior to imaging them. Then I identified the inner cell mass and three Z planes, seven microns apart, were imaged for 60 seconds for both NADH and FAD for each embryo to obtain metabolic measurements. The incubation stage, as seen in the left image, was temperature O2 and CO2 controlled. And the picture on the right was the phlegm setup in our Boston IVF lab. This is a video showing the phlegm images as it is scanning through the different Z planes above and below the inner cell mass. So now onto the results. In each of these graphs, aneuploid is on the left and euploid is on the right. These four graphs represent the NADH metabolic parameters. When comparing euploid versus aneuploid embryos, a significant metabolic difference was seen in NADH fraction bound. NADH fraction bound was still significant when controlling for day of blastocyst development, expansion stage, maternal age, and morphology. And to further validate these results, we performed a bootstrap resampling and found that significant associations were upheld. 
To account for the imbalance of the number of euploid and aneuploid embryos, we reran this analysis using a subset of 17 aneuploid embryos chosen at random to equal the number of euploid embryos. This analysis was repeated 30 times and the significant values are still present. These graphs represent the FAD and redox ratio metabolic parameters. When comparing euploid versus aneuploid embryos, a significant metabolic difference was seen in FAD intensity and redox ratio. And when performing the bootstrap resampling, we found that these significant associations were still upheld. In this next analysis, we wanted to see if metabolic differences were also present when just analyzing the inner cell mass. We therefore manually segmented the inner cell mass in euploid and aneuploid embryos. There were fewer embryos for this part of the analysis due to the inability to clearly manually segment the inner cell mass in 22 embryos. When comparing euploid inner cell mass versus aneuploid inner cell mass, a significant metabolic difference was seen in NADH fraction bound. These graphs presented here are the FAD and redox ratio parameters. When comparing euploid inner cell mass versus aneuploid inner cell mass, a significant metabolic difference was seen in FAD intensity and redox ratio. In the last part of our analysis, uh, we wanted to see if metabolic differences were also present when just analyzing the trophectoderm. We therefore manually segmented the trophectoderm in euploid and aneuploid embryos. And to keep consistent with the inner cell mass analysis, the same cohort of embryos were used for the trophectoderm analysis. When comparing euploid trifectoderm versus aneuploid trifectoderm, a significant metabolic difference was seen in NADH fraction bound. These graphs presented here are the FAD and redox ratio parameters. And when comparing euploid trifectoderm versus aneuploid trifectoderm, a significant metabolic difference was seen in FAD intensity. We also looked at embryo sex. Uh, pooling all euploid and aneuploid embryos together, we compared 46XY versus 46XX embryos and no um, metabolic differences were seen. Furthermore, looking at embryo sex within only euploids and then aneuploids also showed no metabolic differences. A sub-analysis was performed of the aneuploid blastocyst by specific chromosomal abnormality. Listed is the breakdown of the specific aneuploid abnormalities, which included monosomy, trisomy, chaotic, triploidy, and autosomal monosomy. When comparing these aneuploidies to euploid embryos, there were significant metabolic differences for NADH fraction bound and for FAD intensity. However, when looking further at NADH fraction bound and FAD intensity, only euploid versus monosomy trisomy remain significant for NADH fraction bound. Limitations to our study included the use of discarded human, uh, discarded vitrified human embryos may differ significantly um, and metabolically from non-discarded human embryos. The PGTA results from the trifectoderm biopsy may not be an accurate indicator of the presence or absence of aneuploid cells in the inner cell mass. The designation of blastocysts as aneuploid uh, or euploid may contain blastocysts with varying populations of euploid and aneuploid cells. How these relative ratios of euploid to aneuploid cells may influence flint parameters is at this stage unknown. We had a small number of euploid blastocysts available to be assessed. Euploid embryos are very rarely discarded due to their value to patients trying to conceive, which limits their use for research purposes. However, we controlled for the imbalance with the bootstrap resampling analysis. In summary, FLIM has revealed significant metabolic differences between euploid and all aneuploids, ploidy and inner cell mass, and ploidy and trifectoderm. Additional data is required to elucidate the true directional relationship between ploidy status and metabolism. And FLIM is a novel, non-invasive tool for measuring embryo metabolic function. FLIM, however, likely would not be a method to provide a definitive black and white delineation of viable versus non-viable or euploid versus aneuploid embryos. I would expect that FLIM parameters could provide a ranking of the embryo cohort to prioritize uh, the order in which to transfer an embryo. Uh, 
Further human studies are planned to determine if phlegm can assist in clinical embryo selection. And we also want to correlate metabolic signatures with pregnancy outcomes. Thanks to all of my team's hard work, we have been able to contribute to the scientific literature with two publications in human reproduction, as Alan mentioned, um, that we published earlier this year uh, with many other previous posters and oral presentations at national and international conferences. I want to thank my entire team of collaborators at Harvard University and my mentors, Denny Sackis and Alan Penzies of Beth Israel and Boston IVF for supporting my research endeavors with this novel technology. Thank you, and I'm happy to take any questions at this time. Thank you, Jamin. That was really fantastic. Um, we do have a question. Dr. Alper asks, phenomenal research and very well presented. Do you know the variability of phlegm with the same sample? For example, if the sample is run on two different phlegm platforms, what is the expected variability? That's a great question. And we performed some of those studies and it's pretty consistent uh, across uh, different platforms. And that's uh, one of the great things about this technology. Terrific. Um, another question. If you were to look at um, uh, this technology, what would you advise a patient in their early 20s or late 20s, early 30s with respect to PGTA, this technology, or just morphology alone when selecting embryos? It's a great question. I'll start with the PGTA. I mean, there's obviously been lots of literature and this is a hot topic, but you know, we've seen that patients usually less than 35 or even less than 38, the you know, using PGTA isn't really going to increase your chance of success any more than just uh, doing a non, uh, not using PGTA. Um, I think, you know, with this phlegm technology, I think the hope is that in these patients that aren't um, utilizing or where PGTA is not indicated is to using this phlegm so that of maybe the five or eight embryos that they might have, in which order should we transfer and that might help prioritize the um, chance of a live birth. Um, and using this also with morphology, as you can kind of see, when we were looking at the phlegm parameters with morphology, we can see that we really didn't see any difference in metabolic signatures. And there's obviously lots of research showing that, you know, looking at AA versus BA or BB, it's sometimes hard to discern which one is the best one to transfer. Um, and obviously every institution has their own set of protocols, uh, but I think morphology is obviously one that can have subjectivity. Terrific. Um, Dr. Toth asks, is there a relationship of metabolic status of the embryo and a patient's metabolic status? That's a great question. Um, I think that's something that could look, be looked in further studies. Um, that, that's a the very interesting question that I don't have the answer to. Another question. Do you think that this uh, technology could be applied to eggs even before they're inseminated to help further discriminate and limit the number of embryos that get formed in the first place. No, and that's uh, definitely something we've discussed and there have been you know, preliminary studies looking at the phlegm and looking at eggs because for patients that are doing you know, an egg-free cycle for prior preservation, um, you know, is there a way that we can uh, utilize this technology? And I, my hopes is that we will be able to use this in the future um, with future studies down the line. And uh, Dr. Vaughn asks, uh, what does the future of embryo selection look like? How does it, and how does phlegm fit in? For example, five to 10 years from now. Uh, that's a great question. You know, I, I think the way, I think the embryo selection in our field is probably moving towards is more of a, a ranking system. And I think this is where this system, uh, where the phlegm could um, be beneficial. Because currently right now with PGTA, we have either your euploid or your aneuploid. It's kind of black and white. And obviously we know the limitations with that technology with mosaicism and different cell lines within one embryo. So the thought is, I, I think with phlegm and other technologies that can be validated and proven in, in the human model is to create a ranking system that a patient can go and like of these set of embryos, this is the order in which we should transfer an embryo. And I think that's hopefully where the field is probably changing in the next five to 10 years. And, uh, and our final question comes from Dr. Sackas. Are there other fields of medicine that phlegm may be used in in the future? Definitely. I mean, I think, you know, there's, it's already been used in other fields. Uh, I think now in the reproductive sciences, it's now just kind of emerging, um, you know, but there's been a lot of uh, use with phlegm and in cancer technologies and 
and kind of looking at, you know, metabolism and aneuploidy and, you know, and looking at those differences. So there's definitely areas of uh, other parts of medicine that have been using the phlegm already and we're kind of just starting to use it in our field. Well, thank you very much for a super informative and, and well-packaged presentation. I know this is hugely technical and sometimes the technical details can obfuscate uh, what the practical value is, but this really shows how basic science uh, when in the hands of somebody as talented as yourself can be explained in a, in a very fundamental way and uh, how this will help patients uh, fairly soon. Uh, so with that, uh, I congratulate all of our graduating fellows and, I, and, uh, and Dr. Shaw, fantastic.